Canto One of the Story of Rimini. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Rimini by Lee Hunt. Canto One The Coming to Fetch the Bride from Ravenna. The sun is up and tis a morn of may round old ravenna's clear-shown towers and bay a morn the loveliest which the year has seen last of the spring yet fresh with all its green for a warm eve and gentle rains at night have left a sparkling welcome for the light and there's a crystal clearness all about the leaves are sharp the distant hills look out a balmy briskness comes upon the breeze the smoke goes dancing from the cottage trees and when you listen you may hear a coil of bubbling springs about the grassy soil and all the scene in short sky earth and sea breathes like a bright-eyed face that laughs out openly tis nature full of spirits waked and springing the birds to the delicious time are singing darting with freaks and snatches up and down where the light woods go seaward from the town while happy faces striking through the green of leafy roads at every turn are seen and the far ships lifting their sails of white like joyful hands come up with scattery light come gleaming up true to the wished-for day and chase the whistling brine and swirl into the bay and well may all who can come crowding there if peace returning and processions rare and to crown all a marriage in may weather have aught to bring enjoying hearts together for on this sparkling day ravenna's pride the daughter of their prince becomes a bride a bride to crown the comfort of the land and he whose victories have obtained her hand has taken with the dawn so flies report his promised journey to the expecting court with hasting pomp and squires of high degree the bold giovanni lord of rimini already in the streets the stir grows loud of expectation and a bustling crowd with feet and voice the gathering hum contends the deep talk heaves the ready laugh ascends callings and clapping doors and curs unite and shouts from mere exuberance of delight and armed bands making important way gallant and grave the lords of holiday and nodding neighbours greeting as they run and pilgrims chanting in the morning sun with heaved out tapestry the windows glow by lovely faces brought that come and go till the work smoothed and all the street attired they take their seats with upward gaze admired some looking down some forwards or aside as suits the conscious charm in which they pride some turning a trim waist or o'er the flow of crimson cloths hanging a hand of snow but all with smiles prepared and garlands green and all in fluttering talk impatient for the scene and hark the approaching trumpets with a start on the smooth wind come dancing to the heart a moment's hush succeeds and from the walls firm and at once a silver answer calls then heave the crowd and all who best can strive in shuffling struggle toward the palace drive where balconied and broad of marble fair on pillars it o'erlooks the public square for there duke guido is to hold his state with his fair daughter seated o'er the gate but the full place rejects the invading tide and after a rude heave from side to side with angry faces turned and feet regained the peaceful press with order is maintained leaving the doorways only for the crowd the space within for the procession proud for in this manner is the square set out the sides path deep are crowded round about and faced with guards who keep the road entire and opposite to these a brilliant choir of knights and ladies hold the central spot seated in groups upon a grassy plot the seats with boughs are shaded from above of early trees transplanted from a grove and in the midst fresh whistling through the scene a lightsome fountain starts from out the green clear and compact till at its height o'er run it shakes its loosening silver in the sun there talking with the ladies you may see standing about or seated frank and free some of the finest warriors of the court baptist and hugo of the princely port and azo and obizo and the grace of frank esmerial with his open face and felix the fine arm and him who well repays his lavish honours lionel besides a host of spirits nursed in glory fit for sweet woman's love and for the poet's story 
there too in thickest of the bright-eyed throng stands the young father of italian song guy cavalcanti of a knightly race the poet looks out in his earnest face he with the pheasant's plume there bending now something he speaks around him with a bow and all the listening looks with nods and flushes break round him into smiles and sparkling blushes another start of trumpets with reply and o'er the gate a sudden canopy raises on ivory shafts a crimson shade and guido issues with the princely maid and sits the courtiers fall on either side but every look is fixed upon the bride who pensive comes at first and hardly hears the enormous shout that springs as she appears till as she views the countless gaze below and faces that with grateful homage glow a home to leave and husband yet to see fade in the warmth of that great charity and hard it is she thinks to have no will but not to bless these thousands harder still with that a keen and quivering glance of tears scarce moves her patient mouth and disappears a smile is underneath and breaks away and round she looks and breathes as best befits the day what need i tell of lovely lips and eyes a clipsome waist and bosom's balmy rise the dress of bridal white and the dark curls bedding an airy coronet of pearls there's not in all that crowd one gallant being whom if his heart were whole and rank agreeing it would not fire to twice of what he is to clasp her to his heart and call her his while thus with tiptoe looks the people gaze another shout the neighbouring quarters raise the train are in the town and gathering near with noise of cavalry and trumpets clear a princely music unbedinned with drums the mighty brass seems opening as it comes and now it fills and now it shakes the air and now it bursts into the sounding square at which the crowd with such a shout rejoice each thinks he's deafened with his neighbour's voice then with a long-drawn breath the clangors die the palace trumpets give a last reply and clattering hoofs succeed with stately stir of snortings proud and clinking furniture it seems as if the harnessed war were near but in their garb of peace the train appear their swords alone reserved but idly hung and the chains freed by which their shields were slung first come the trumpeters clad all in white except the breast which wears a scutcheon bright by four and four they ride on horses grey and as they sit along their easy way stately and heaving to the sway below each plants his trumpet on his saddle-bow the heralds next appear in vests attired of stiffening gold with radiant colours fired and then the pursuivants who wait on these all dressed in painted richness to the knees each rides a dappled horse and bears a shield charged with three heads upon a golden field twelve ranks of squires come after twelve in one with forked pennons lifted in the sun which tell as they look backward in the wind the bearings of the knights that ride behind their steeds are ruddy bay and every squire his master's colour shows in his attire these passed and at a lordly distance come the knights themselves and fill the quickening hum the flower of rimini apart they ride six in a row and with a various pride but all as fresh as fancy could desire all shapes of gallantry on steeds of fire differing in colours is the knight's array the horses black and chestnut rowan and bay the horsemen crimson vested purple and white all but the scarlet cloak for every knight which thrown apart and hanging loose behind rests on his steed and ruffles in the wind their caps of velvet have a lightsome fit each with a dancing feather sweeping it tumbling its white against their short dark hair but what is of the most accomplished air all wear memorials of their lady's love a ribbon or a scarf or silken glove some tied about their arm some at the breast some with a drag dangling from the cap's crest a suitable attire the horses show their golden bits keep wrangling as they go the bridles glance about with gold and gems and the rich housing cloths above the hems which comb along the ground with golden pegs are half of net to show the hinder legs some of the cloths themselves are golden thread with silk inwoven asia green or red some spotted on a ground of different hue as burning stars upon a cloth of blue or purple smearings with a velvet light rich from the glary yellow thickening bright 
or a spring green powdered with april posies or flush vermilion set with silver roses but all are wide and large and with the wind when it comes fresh goes sweeping out behind with various earnestness the crowd admire horsemen and horse the motion and the attire some watch as they go by the riders faces looking composure and their knightly graces the life the carelessness the sudden heed the body curving to the rearing steed the patting hand that best persuades the check and makes the quarrel up with a proud neck the thigh broad pressed the spanning palm upon it and the jerked feather swaling in the bonnet others the horses and their pride explore their jauntiness behind and strength before the flowing back firm chest and fetlocks clean the branching veins ridging the glossy lean the mane hung sleekly the projecting eye that to the stander near looks awfully the finished head in its compactness free small and o'erarching to the lifted knee the start and snatch as if they felt the comb with mouths that fling about the creamy foam the snorting turbulence the nod the champing the shift the tossing and the fiery tramping and now the princess pale and with fixed eye perceives the last of those precursors nigh each rank uncovering as they pass in state both to the courtly fountain and the gate and then a second interval succeeds of stately length and then a troop of steeds milk-white and unattired arabian bred each by a blooming boy lightsomely led in every limb is seen their faultless race a fire well tempered and a free left grace slender their spotless shapes and meet the sight with freshness after all those colours bright and as with quoit like drop their steps they bear they lend their streaming tails to the fond air these for a princely present are divined and show the giver is not far behind the talk increases now and now advance space after space with many a sprightly prance the pages of the court in rows of three of white and crimson is their livery space after space and yet the attendants come and deeper goes about the impatient hum ah yes no tis not he but tis the squires who go before him when his pomp requires and now his huntsman shows the lessening train now the squire carver and the chamberlain and now his banner comes and now his shield borne by the squire that waits him to the field and then an interval a lordly space a pin-drop silence strikes o'er all the place the princess from a distance scarcely knows which way to look her colour comes and goes and with an impulse and affection free she lays her hand upon her father's knee who looks upon her with a laboured smile gathering it up into his own the while when some one's voice as if it knew not how to check itself exclaims the prince now now and on a milk-white courser like the air a glorious figure springs into the square up with a burst of thunder goes the shout and rolls the trembling walls and peopled roofs about never was nobler finish of fine sight twas like the coming of a shape of light and every lovely gazer with a start felt the quick pleasure smite across her heart the princess who at first could scarcely see though looking still that way from dignity gathers new courage as the praise goes round and bends her eyes to learn what they have found and see his horse obeys the check unseen and with an air twixt ardent and serene letting a fall of curls about his brow he takes his cap off with a gallant bow then for another and a deafening shout and scarfs are waved and flowers come fluttering out and shaken by the noise the reeling air sweeps with a giddy whirl among the fair and whisks their garments and their shining hair with busy interchange of wonder glows the crowd and loves his brilliance as he goes the golden fretted cap the downward feather the crimson vest fitting with pearls together the rest in snowy white from the mid-thigh these catch the extrinsic and the common eye but on his shape the gentler sight attends moves as he passes as he bends him bends watches his air his gesture and his face and thinks it never saw such manly grace so fine are his bare throat and curls of black so lightsomely dropped in his lordly back his thigh so fitted for the tilt or dance so heaped with strength and turned with elegance but above all so meaning is his look full and as readable as open book and so much easy dignity there lies in the frank lifting of his cordial eyes 
his haughty steed who seems by turns to be vexed and made proud by that cool mastery shakes at his bit and rolls his eyes with care reaching with stately step at the fine air and now and then sidling his restless pace drops with his hinder legs and shifts his place and feels through all his frame a fiery thrill the princely rider on his back sits still and looks where'er he likes and sways him at his will surprise relief a joy scarce understood something perhaps of very gratitude and fifty feelings undefined and new dance through the bride and flush her faded hue could i but once she thinks securely place a trust for the contents on such a case and know the spirit that should fill that dwelling this chance of mine would hardly be compelling just then the stranger coming slowly round by the clear fountain and the brilliant ground and bending as he goes with frequent thanks beckons a follower to him from the ranks and loosening as he speaks from its light hold a dropping jewel with its chain of gold sends it in token he had loved him long to the young father of italian song the youth smiles up and with a lowly grace bending his lifted eyes and blushing face looks after his new friend who scarcely gone in the wide turning nods and passes on this is sufficient for the destined bride she took an interest first but now a pride and as the prince comes riding to the place bearing his head and raising his fine face she meets his full obeisance with an eye of self-permission and sweet gravity he looks with touched respect and gazes and goes by end of canto one Canto two of the story of Rimini. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The story of Rimini by Lee Hunt. Canto two: The Bride's Journey to Rimini. We'll pass the followers and their closing state. The court was entered by a hinder gate. The duke and princess had retired before, joined by the knights and ladies at the door but something seemed amiss and there ensued deep talk among the spreading multitude who got in clumps or paced the measured street filling with earnest hum the noontide heat nor ceased the wonder as the day increased and brought no symptoms of a bridal feast no mass no tilt no largesse for the crowd nothing to answer that procession proud but a blank look as if no court had been silence without and secrecy within and nothing heard by listening at the walls but now and then a bustling through the halls or the dim organ roused at gathering intervals the truth was this the bridegroom had not come but sent his brother proxy in his room a lofty spirit the former was and proud little gallant and had a sort of cloud hanging for ever on his cold address which he mistook for proper manliness but more of this hereafter guido knew the prince's character and he knew too that sweet as was his daughter and prepared to do her duty where appeal was barred she had stout notions on the marrying score and where the match unequal prospect bore might pause with firmness and refuse to strike a chord her own sweet music so unlike the old man therefore kind enough at heart yet fond from habit of intrigue and art and little formed for sentiments like these which seemed to him mere maiden niceties had thought at once to gratify the pride of his stern neighbour and secure the bride by telling him that if as he had heard busy he was just then twas but a word and he might send and wed her by another of course no less a person than his brother the bride meantime was told and not unmoved to look for one no sooner seen than loved and when giovanni struck with what he thought mere proof how his triumphant hand was sought dispatched the wished-for prince who was a creature formed in the very poetry of nature the effect was perfect and the future wife caught in the elaborate snare perhaps for life one shock there was however to sustain which nigh restored her to herself again she saw when all were housed in guido's face a look of leisurely surprise take place a little whispering followed for a while and then twas told her with an easy smile that prince giovanni to his great chagrin had been delayed by something unforeseen 
but rather than defer his day of bliss if his fair ruler took it not amiss had sent his brother paolo in his stead who said old guido with a nodding head may well be said to represent his brother for when you see the one you know the other by this time paolo joined them where they stood and seeing her in some uneasy mood changed the mere cold respects his brother sent to such a strain of cordial compliment and paid them with an air so frank and bright as to a friend appreciated at sight that air in short which sets you at your ease without implying your perplexities that what with the surprise in every way the hurry of the time the appointed day the very shame which now appeared increased of begging leave to have her hand released and above all those tones and smiles and looks which seemed to realize the dreams of books and helped her genial fancy to conclude that fruit of such a stock must all be good she knew not how to object in her confusion quick were the marriage rites and in conclusion the proxy turning midst the general hush kissed her meek lips betwixt a rosy blush at last about the vesper hour a score of trumpets issued from the palace door the banners of their brass with favours tied and with a blast proclaimed the wedded bride but not a word the sullen silence broke till something of a gift the herald spoke and with a bag of money issuing out scattered the ready harvest round about then burst the mob into a jovial cry and largess largess claps against the sky and bold giovanni's name the lord of rimini the rest however still were looking on careless and mute and scarce the noise was gone when riding from the gate with banners reared again the morning visitors appeared the prince was in his place and in a car before him glistening like a farewell star sat the dear lady with her brimming eyes and off they set through doubtful looks and cries for some too shrewdly guessed and some were vexed at the dull day and some the whole perplexed and all great pity thought it to divide two that seemed made for bridegroom and for bride even she whose heart this strange abrupt event had seared as twere with burning wonderment could scarce at times a passionate cry forbear at leaving her own home and native air till passing now the limits of the town and on the last few gazers looking down she saw by the roadside an aged throng who wanting power to bustle with the strong had learnt their gracious mistress was to go and gathered there an unconcerted show bending they stood with their old foreheads bare and the winds fingered with their reverend hair farewell farewell my friends she would have cried but in her throat the leaping accents died and waving with her hand a vain adieu she dropped her veil and backwarder withdrew and let the kindly tears their own good course pursue it was a lovely evening fit to close a lovely day and brilliant in repose warm but not dim a glow was in the air the softened breeze came smoothing here and there and every tree in passing one by one gleamed out with twinkles of the golden sun for leafy was the road with tall array on either side of mulberry and bay and distant snatches of blue hills between and there the alder was with its bright green and the broad chestnut and the poplar's shoot that like a feather waves from head to foot with ever and anon majestic pines and still from tree to tree the early vines hung garlanding the way in amber lines nor long the princess kept her from the view of that dear scenery with its parting hue for sitting now calm from the gush of tears with dreaming eye fixed down and half shut ears hearing yet hearing not the fervent sound of hoofs thick reckoning and the wheels moist round a call of slower from the farther part of the checked riders woke her with a start and looking up again half sigh half stare she lifts her veil and feels the freshening air tis down a hill they go gentle indeed and such as with a bold and pranksome speed another time they would have scorned to measure but now they take with them a lovely treasure and feel they should consult her gentle pleasure and now with thicker shades the pines appear the noise of hoofs grows duller to her ear and quitting suddenly their gravelly toil the wheels go spinning o'er a sandy soil here first the silence of the country seems to come about her with its listening dreams and full of anxious thoughts half freed from pain in downward musing she relapsed again 
leaving the others who had passed that way in careless spirits of the early day to look about and mark the reverent scene for awful tales renowned and everlasting green a heavy spot the forest looks at first to one grim shade condemned and sandy thirst or only chequered here and there with bushes dusty and sharp or plashy pools with rushes about whose sides the swarming insects fry opening with noisome din as they go by but entering more and more they quit the sand at once and strike upon a grassy land from which the trees as from a carpet rise in knolls and clumps with rich varieties a moment's trouble find the knights to rein their horses in which feeling turf again thrill and curvet and long to be at large to scour the space and give the winds a charge or pulling tight the bridles as they pass dip their warm mouths into the freshening grass but soon in easy rank from glade to glade proceed they coasting underneath the shade some bearing to the cool their placid brows some looking upward through the glimmering boughs or peering grave through inward opening places and half prepared for glimpse of shadowy faces various the trees and passing foliage here wild pear and oak and dusky juniper with briony between in trails of white and ivy and the suckle streaky light and moss warm gleaming with a sudden mark like flings of sunshine left upon the bark and still the pine long-haired and dark and tall in lordly right predominant o'er all much they admire that old religious tree with shaft above the rest up shooting free and shaking when its dark locks feel the wind its wealthy fruit with rough mosaic rind at noisy intervals the living cloud of cawing rooks breaks o'er them gathering loud like a wild people at a stranger's coming then hushing paths succeed with insects humming or ring dove that repeats his pensive plea or startled gull up screaming towards the sea but scarce their eyes encounter living thing save now and then a goat loose wandering or a few cattle looking up aslant with sleepy eyes and meek mouths ruminant or once a plodding woodman old and bent passing with half indifferent wonderment yet turning at the last to look once more then feels his trembling staff and onward as before so ride they pleased till now the couching sun levels his final look through shadows dun and the clear moon with meek awe lifted face seems come to look into the silvering place then first the bride waked up for then was heard sole voice the poets and the lovers bird preluding first as if the sounds were cast for the dear leaves about her till at last with shot out raptures in a perfect shower she vents her heart on the delicious hour lightly the horsemen go as if they'd ride a velvet path and hear no voice beside a placid hope assures the breath suspended bride so ride they in delight through beam and shade till many a rill now passed and many a glade they quit the piney labyrinths and soon emerge into the full and sheeted moon chilling it seems and pushing steed on steed they start them freshly with a homeward speed then well-known fields they pass and straggling cots boy storied trees and passion plighted spots and turning last a sudden corner see the square lit towers of slumbering rimini the marble bridge comes heaving forth below with a long gleam and nearer as they go they see the still marecchia cold and bright sleeping along with face against the light a hollow trample now a fall of chains the bride has entered not a voice remains night and a maiden silence wrap the plains end of canto two canto three of the story of rimini this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Rimini by Lee Hunt Canto Three, The Fatal Passion Now why must I disturb a dream of bliss, or bring cold sorrow twixt the wedded kiss? Sad is the strain with which I cheer my long and caged hours, and try my native tongue. 
now too while rains autumnal as i sing wash the dull baths chilling my sicklied wing and all the climate presses on my sense but thoughts it furnishes of things far hence and leafy dreams affords me and a feeling which i should else disdain tear dipped and healing and shows me more than what it first designed how little upon earth our home we find or close the intended course of erring human kind enough of this yet how shall i disclose the weeping days that with the morning rose how bring the bitter disappointment in the holy cheat the virtue binding sin the shock that told this lovely trusting heart that she had given beyond all power to part her hope belief love passion to one brother possession oh the misery to another some likeness was there twixt the two an air at times a cheek a colour of the hair a tone when speaking of indifferent things nor by the scale of common measurings would you say more perhaps than that the one was more robust the other finelier spun that of the two giovanni was the graver paolo the livelier and the more in favour some tastes there were indeed that would prefer giovanni's countenance as the marshaller and twas a soldier's truly if an eye ardent and cool at once drawn back and high an eagle's nose and a determined lip were the best marks of manly soldiership paolo's was fashioned in a different mould and finer still i think for though twas bold when boldness was required and could put on a glowing frown as if an angel shone yet there was nothing in it one might call a stamp exclusive or professional no courtier's face and yet its smile was ready no scholars yet its look was deep and steady no soldiers for its power was all of mind too true for violence and too refined a graceful nose was his lightsomely brought down from a forehead of clear-spirited thought wisdom looked sweet and inward from his eye and round his mouth was sensibility it was a face in short seemed made to show how far the genuine flesh and blood could go a morning glass of unaffected nature something that baffled every pompous feature the visage of a glorious human creature if any points there were at which they came nearer together twas in knightly fame and all accomplishments that art may know hunting and princely hawking and the bow the rush together in the bright-eyed list forethoughted chess the riddle rarely missed and the decision of still knottier points with knife in hand of boar and peacock joints things that might shake the fame that tristan got and bring a doubt on perfect lancelot but leave we knighthood to the former part the tale i tell is of the human heart the worst of prince giovanni as his bride too quickly found was an ill-tempered pride bold handsome able if he chose to please punctual and right in common offices he lost the sight of conduct's only worth the scattering smiles on this uneasy earth and on the strength of virtues of small weight claimed towards himself the exercise of great he kept no reckoning with his sweets and sours he'd hold a sullen countenance for hours and then if pleased to cheer himself a space look for the immediate rapture in your face and wonder that a cloud could still be there how small soever when his own was fair yet such is conscience so designed to keep stern central watch though all things else go sleep and so much knowledge of one's self there lies cord after all in our complacencies that no suspicion would have touched him more than that of wanting on the generous score he would have whelmed you with a weight of scorn been proud at eve inflexible at morn in short ill-tempered for a week to come and all to strike that desperate error dumb taste had he in a word for high-turned merit but not the patience or the genial spirit and so he made twixt virtue and defect a sort of fierce demand on your respect which if assisted by his high degree it gave him in some eyes a dignity and struck a meaner deference in the many left him at last unlovable with any from this complexion in the reigning brother his younger birth perhaps had saved the other born to a homage less gratuitous he learned to win a nobler for his house and both from habit and a genial heart without much trouble of the reasoning art found this the wisdom and the sovereign good to be and make as happy as he could not that he saw or thought he saw beyond his general age 
and could not be as fond of wars and creeds as any of his race but most he loved a happy human face and wheresoe'er his fine frank eyes were thrown he struck the looks he wished for with his own his danger was lest feeling as he did too lightly he might leap o'er means forbid and in some tempting hour lose sight of crime or some sweet face too happy for the time but fears like these he never entertained and had they crossed him would have been disdained warm was his youth tis true nor had been free from lighter loves but virtue reverenced he and had been kept from men of pleasure's cares by dint of feelings still more warm than theirs so what but service leapt where'er he went was there a tilt day or a tournament for welcome grace there rode not such another nor yet for strength except his lordly brother was there a court day or a sparkling feast or better still in my ideas at least a summer party to the greenwood shade with lutes prepared and cloth on herbage laid and ladies laughter coming through the air he was the readiest and the blithest there and made the time so exquisitely pass with stories told with elbow on the grass or touched the music in his turn so finely that all he did they thought was done divinely the lovely stranger could not fail to see too soon this difference more especially as her consent too lightly now she thought with hopes far different had been strangely bought and many a time the pain of that neglect would strike in blushes o'er her self-respect but since the ill was cureless she applied with busy virtue to resume her pride and hoped to value her submissive heart on playing well a patriot daughter's part trying her new-found duties to prefer to what a father might have owed to her the very day too when her first surprise was full kind tears had come into her eyes on finding by his care her private room furnished like magic from her own at home the very books and all transported there the leafy tapestry and the crimson chair the lute the glass that told the shedding hours the little urn of silver for the flowers the frame for broidering with a piece half done and the white falcon basking in the sun who when he saw her sidled on his stand and twined his neck against her trembling hand but what had touched her nearest was the thought that if twere destined for her to be brought to a sweet mother's bed the joy would be giovanni's too and his her family he seemed already father of her child and on the nestling pledge in patient thought she smiled yet then a pang would cross her and the red in either downward cheek startle and spread to think that he who was to have such part in joys like these had never shared her heart but back she chased it with a sigh austere and did she chance at times like these to hear her husband's footstep she would hasten the more and with a double smile open the door and ask him after all his morning's doing how his new soldiers pleased him in reviewing or if the boar was slain which he had been pursuing the prince at this would bend on her an eye cordial enough and kiss her tenderly nor to say truly was he slow in common to accept the attentions of this lovely woman but then meantime he took no generous pains by mutual pleasing to secure his gains he entered not in turn in her delights her books her flowers her taste for rural sights nay scarcely her sweet singing minded he unless his pride was roused by company or when to please him after martial play she strained her lute to some old fiery lay of fierce orlando or of ferumbras or ryan's cloak or how by the red grass in battle you might know where richard was yet all the while no doubt however stern or cold at times he thought he loved in turn and that the joy he took in her sweet ways the pride he felt when she excited praise in short the enjoyment of his own good pleasure was thanks enough and passion beyond measure she had she loved him might have thought so too for what will love's exalting not go through till long neglect and utter selfishness shame the fond pride it takes in its distress but ill prepared was she in her hard lot to fancy merit where she found it not she who had been beguiled she who was made within a gentle bosom to be laid to bless and to be blessed to be heart bare to one who found his bettered likeness there to think forever with him like a bride to haunt his eye like taste personified to double his delight to share his sorrow and like a morning beam wake to him every morrow paolo meantime who ever since the day he saw her sweet looks bending o'er his way had stored them up unconsciously as graces by which to judge all other forms and faces 
had learned i know not how the secret snare which gave her up that evening to his care some babbler may be of old guido's court or foolish friend had told him half in sport but to his heart the fatal flattery went and grave he grew and inwardly intent and ran back in his mind with sudden spring look gesture smile speech silence everything even what before had seemed indifference and read them over in another sense then would he blush with sudden self-disdain to think how fanciful he was and vain and with half angry half regretful sigh tossing his chin and feigning a free eye breathe off as twere the idle tale and look about him for his falcon or his book scorning that ever he should entertain one thought that in the end might give his brother pain this start however came so often round so often fell he in deep thought and found occasion to renew his carelessness yet every time the power grown less and less that by degrees half wearied half inclined to the sweet struggling image he resigned and merely as he thought to make the best of what by force would come about his breast began to bend down his admiring eyes on all her touching looks and qualities turning their shapely sweetness every way till twas his food and habit day by day and she became companion of his thought silence her gentleness before him brought society her sense reading her books music her voice every sweet thing her looks which sometimes seemed when he sat fixed awhile to steal beneath his eyes with upward smile and did he stroll into some lonely place under the trees upon the thick soft grass how charming would he think to see her here how heightened then and perfect would appear the two divinest things this world has got a lovely woman in a rural spot thus daily went he on gathering sweet pain about his fancy till it thrilled again and if his brother's image less and less startled him up from his new idleness twas not he fancied that he reasoned worse or felt less scorn of wrong but the reverse that one should think of injuring another or trenching on his peace this too a brother and all from selfishness and pure weak will to him seemed marvellous and impossible tis true thought he one being more there was who might meantime have weary hours to pass one weaker too to bear them and for whom no matter he could not reverse her doom and so he sighed and smiled as if one thought of paltering could suppose that he was to be caught yet if she loved him common gratitude if not a sense of what was fair and good besides his new relationship and right would make him wish to please her all he might and as to thinking where could be the harm if to his heart he kept its secret charm he wished not to himself another's blessing but then he might console for not possessing and glorious things there were which but to see and not admire was mere stupidity he might as well object to his own eyes for loving to behold the fields and skies his neighbour's grove or story painted hall twas but the taste for what was natural only his favourite thought was loveliest of them all concluding thus and happier that he knew his ground so well near and more near he drew and sanctioned by his brother's manner spent hours by her side as happy as well meant he read with her he rode he went a-hawking he spent still evenings in delightful talking while she sat busy at her broidery frame or touched the lute with her and when they came to some fine part prepared her for the pleasure and then with double smile stole on the measure then at the tournament who there but she made him more gallant still than formerly couch o'er his tightened lance with double force pass like the wind sweeping down man and horse and franklier then than ever midst the shout and dancing trumpets ride uncovered round about his brother only more than hitherto he would avoid or sooner let subdue partly from something strange unfelt before partly because giovanni sometimes wore a knot his bride had worked him green and gold for in all things with nature did she hold and while twas being worked her fancy was of sunbeams mingling with a tuft of grass francesca from herself but ill could hide what pleasure now was added to her side how placidly yet fast the days succeeded with one who thought and felt so much as she did and how the chair he sat in and the room began to look when he had failed to come but as she better knew the cause than he she seemed to have the more necessity for struggling hard and rousing all her pride and so she did at first 
she even tried to feel a sort of anger at his care but these extremes brought but a kind despair and then she only spoke more sweetly to him and found her failing eyes give looks that melted through him giovanni too who felt relieved indeed to see another to his place succeed or rather filling up some trifling hours better spent elsewhere and beneath his powers left the new tie to strengthen day by day talked less and less and longer kept away secure in his self-love and sense of right that he was welcome most come when he might and doubtless they in their still finer sense with added care repaid this confidence turning their thoughts from his abuse of it to what on their own parts was graceful and was fit ah now ye gentle pair now think a while now while ye still can think and still can smile now while your generous hearts have not been grieved perhaps with something not to be retrieved and ye have still within the power of gladness from self-resentment free and retrospective madness so did they think but partly from delay partly from fancied ignorance of the way and most from feeling the bare contemplation give them fresh need of mutual consolation they scarcely tried to see each other less and did but meet with deeper tenderness living from day to day as they were used only with graver thoughts and smiles reduced and sighs more frequent which when one would heave the other longed to start up and receive for whether some suspicion now had crossed giovanni's mind or whether he had lost more of his temper lately he would treat his wife with petty scorns and starts of heat and to his own omissions proudly blind or look the pains she took to make him kind and yet be angry if he thought them less he found reproaches in her meek distress forcing her silent tears and then resenting then almost angrier grown from half repenting and hinting at the last that some there were better perhaps than he and tastefuller and these for what he knew he little cared might please her and be pleased though he despaired then would he quit the room and half disdain himself for being in so harsh a strain and venting thus his temper on a woman yet not the more for that changed he in common or took more pains to please her and be near what should he truckle to a woman's tear at times like these the princess tried to shun the face of paolo as too kind a one and shutting up her tears with resolute sigh would walk into the air and see the sky and feel about her all the garden green and hear the birds that shot the covert boughs between a noble range it was of many a rood walled round with trees and ending in a wood indeed the whole was leafy and it had a winding stream about clear and glad that danced from shade to shade and on its way seemed smiling with delight to feel the day there was the pouting rose both red and white the flamy heartsies flushed with purple light blush hiding strawberry sunny coloured box hyacinth handsome with his clustering locks the lady lily looking gently down pure lavender to lay in bridal gown the daisy lovely on both sides in short all the sweet cups to which the bees resort with plots of grass and perfumed walks between of citron honeysuckle and jessamine with orange whose warm leaves so finely suit and look as if they'd shade a golden fruit and midst the flowers turfed round beneath a shade of circling pines a babbling fountain played and twixt their shafts you saw the water bright which through the darksome tops glimmered with showering light so now you walked beside an odorous bed of gorgeous hues white azure golden red and now turned off into a leafy walk close and continuous fit for lovers talk and now pursued the stream and as you trod onward and onward o'er the velvet sod felt on your face an air watery and sweet and a new sense in your soft lighting feet and then perhaps you entered upon shades pillowed with dells and uplands twixt the glades through which the distant palace now and then looked lordly forth with many windowed ken a land of trees which reaching round about in shady blessing stretched their old arms out with spots of sunny opening and with nooks to lie and read in sloping into brooks where at her drink you started the slim deer retreating lightly with a lovely fear and all about the birds kept leafy house and sung and sparkled in and out the bowers and all about a lovely sky of blue clearly was felt or down the leaves laughed through and here and there in every part were seats 
some in the open walks some in retreats with bowering leaves o'erhead to which the eye looked up half sweetly and half awfully places of nestling green for poets made where when the sunshine struck a yellow shade the slender trunks to inward peeping sight thronged in dark pillars up the gold green light but twixt the wood and flowery walks half way and formed of both the loveliest portion lay a spot that struck you like enchanted ground it was a shallow dell set in a mound of sloping shrubs that mounted by degrees the birch and poplar mixed with heavier trees from under which sent through a marble spout betwixt the dark wet green a rill gushed out whose low sweet talking seemed as if it said something eternal to that happy shade the ground within was lawn with plots of flowers heaped towards the centre and with citron bowers and in the midst of all clustered about with bay and myrtle and just gleaming out lurked a pavilion a delicious sight small marble well proportioned mellowy white with yellow vine leaves sprinkled but no more and a young orange either side the door the door was to the wood forward and square the rest was domed at top and circular and through the dome the only light came in tinged as it entered with the vine leaves thin it was a beauteous piece of ancient skill spared from the rage of war and perfect still by most supposed the work of fairy hands famed for luxurious taste and choice of lands alcina or morgana who from fights and errant fame inveigled amorous knights and lived with them in a long round of blisses feasts concerts baths and bower in shaded kisses but twas a temple as its sculpture told built to the nymphs that haunted there of old for o'er the door was carved a sacrifice by girls and shepherds brought with reverend eyes of sylvan drinks and foods simple and sweet and goats with struggling horns and planted feet and on a line with this ran round about a like relief touched exquisitely out that showed in various scenes the nymphs themselves some by the waterside on bowery shelves leaning at will some in the water sporting with sides half swelling forth and looks of courting some in a flowery dell hearing a swain play on his pipe till the hills ring again some tying up their long moist hair some sleeping under the trees with fawns and satyrs peeping or sidelong eyed pretending not to see the latter in the brakes come creepingly while their forgotten urns lying about in the green herbage let the water out never be sure before or since was seen a summer-house so fine in such a nest of green all the green garden flower-bed shade and plot francesca loved but most of all this spot whenever she walked forth wherever went about the grounds to this at last she bent here she had brought a lute and a few books here would she lie for hours with grateful looks thanking at heart the sunshine and the leaves the summer raindrops counting from the eaves and all that promising calm smile we see in nature's face when we look patiently then would she think of heaven and you might hear sometimes when everything was hushed and clear her gentle voice from out those shades emerging singing the evening anthem to the virgin the gardeners and the rest who served the place and blessed whenever they beheld her face knelt when they heard it bowing and uncovered and felt as if in air some sainted beauty hovered one day twas on a summer afternoon when airs and gurgling brooks are best in tune and grasshoppers are loud and day work done and shades have heavy outlines in the sun the princess came to her accustomed bower to get her if she could a soothing hour trying as she was used to leave her cares without and slumberously enjoy the airs and the low talking leaves and that cool light the vines let in and all that hushing sight of closing wood seen through the opening door and distant plash of waters tumbling o'er and smell of citron blooms and fifty luxuries more she tried as usual for the trial's sake for even that diminished her heartache and never yet how ill so e'er at ease came she for nothing midst the flowers and trees yet somehow or another on that day she seemed to feel too lightly borne away too much relieved too much inclined to draw a careless joy from everything she saw and looking round her with a new-born eye as if some tree of knowledge had been nigh 
to taste of nature primitive and free and bask at ease in her heart's liberty painfully clear those rising thoughts appeared with something dark at bottom that she feared and snatching from the fields her thoughtful look she reached o'er head and took her down a book and fell to reading with as fixed an air as though she had been wrapped since morning there twas lancelot of the lake a bright romance that like a trumpet made young pulses dance yet had a softer note that shook still more she had begun it but the day before and read with a full heart half sweet half sad how old king ban was spoiled of all he had but one fair castle how one summer's day with his fair queen and child he went away to ask the great king arthur for assistance how reaching by himself a hill at distance he turned to give his castle a last look and saw its far white face and how a smoke as he was looking burst in volumes forth and good king ban saw all that he was worth and his fair castle burning to the ground so that his wearied pulse felt overwound and he lay down and said a prayer apart for those he loved and broke his poor old heart then read she of the queen with her young child how she came up and nearly had gone wild and how in journeying on in her despair she reached a lake and met a lady there who pitied her and took the baby sweet into her arms when lo with closing feet she sprang up all at once like bird from break and vanished with him underneath the lake the mother's feelings we as well may pass the fairy of the place that lady was and launcelot so the boy was called became her inmate till in search of knightly fame he went to arthur's court and played his part so rarely and displayed so frank a heart that what with all his charms of look and limb the queen genura fell in love with him and here with growing interest in her reading the princess doubly fixed was now proceeding ready she sat with one hand to turn o'er the leaf to which her thoughts ran on before the other propping her white brow and throwing its ringlets out under the skylight glowing so sat she fixed and so observed was she of one who at the door stood tenderly paolo who from a window seeing her go straight across the lawn and guessing where had thought she was in tears and found that day his usual efforts vain to keep away may i come in said he it made her start that smiling voice she coloured pressed her heart a moment as for breath and then with free and usual tone said oh yes certainly there's apt to be at conscious times like these an affectation of a bright-eyed ease an air of something quite serene and sure as if to seem so was to be secure with this the lovers met with this they spoke with this they sat down to the self-same book and paolo by degrees gently embraced with one permitted arm her lovely waist and both their cheeks like peaches on a tree leaned with a touch together thrillingly and o'er the book they hung and nothing said and every lingering page grew longer as they read and thus they sat and felt with leaps of heart their colour change they came upon the part where fond genura with her flame long nursed smiled upon launcelot when he kissed her first that touch at last through every fibre slid and paolo turned scarce knowing what he did only he felt he could no more dissemble and kissed her mouth to mouth all in a tremble sad were those hearts and sweet was that long kiss sacred be love from sight whate'er it is the world was all forgot the struggle o'er desperate the joy that day they read no more End of Canto 3it has surprised me often as i write that i who have of late known small delight should thus pursue a mournful theme and make my very solace of distress partake and i have longed sometimes i must confess to start at once from notes of wretchedness and in a key would make you rise and dance strike up a blithe defiance to mischance 
but work begun an interest in it shame at turning coward to the thoughts i frame necessity to keep firm face on sorrow some flattering sweet-lipped question every morrow and above all the poet's task divine of making tears themselves look up and shine and turning to a charm the sorrow past have held me on and shall do to the last sorrow to him who has a true touched ear is but the discord of a warbling sphere a lurking contrast which though harsh it be distills the next note more deliciously e'en tales like this founded on real woe from bitter seed to balmy fruitage grow the woe was earthly fugitive is past the song that sweetens it may always last and even they whose shattered hearts and frames make them unhappiest of poetic names what are they if they know their calling high but crushed perfumes exhaling to the sky or weeping clouds that but a while are seen yet keep the earth they haste to bright and green once and but once nor with a scornful face tried worth will hear that scene again took place partly by chance they met partly to see the spot where they had last gone smilingly but most from failure of all self-support and oh the meeting in that loved resort no peevishness there was no loud distress no mean recriminating selfishness but a mute gush of hiding tears from one clasped to the core of him who yet shed none and self-accusings then which he began and into which her tearful sweetness ran and then kind looks with meeting eyes again starting to deprecate the other's pain till half persuasions they could scarce do wrong and sudden sense of wretchedness more strong and why should i add more again they parted he doubly torn for her and she nigh broken-hearted she never ventured in that spot again and paolo knew it but could not refrain he went again one day and how it looked the calm old shade his presence felt rebuked it seemed as if the hopes of his young heart his kindness and his generous scorn of art had all been a mere dream or at the best a vain negation that could stand no test and that on waking from his idle fit he found himself how could he think of it a selfish boaster and a hypocrite that thought before had grieved him but the pain cut sharp and sudden now it came again sick thoughts of late had made his body sick and this in turn to them grown strangely quick and pale he stood and seemed to burst all o'er into moist anguish never felt before and with a dreadful certainty to know his peace was gone and all to come was woe francesca too the being made to bless destined by him to the same wretchedness it seemed as if such whelming thoughts must find some props for them or he should lose his mind and find he did not what the worst disease of want of charity calls sophistries nor what can cure a generous heart of pain but humble guesses helping to sustain he thought with quick philosophy of things rarely found out except through sufferings of habit circumstance design degree merit and will and thoughtful charity and these although they pushed down as they rose his self-respect and all those morning shows of true and perfect which his youth had built pushed with them too the worst of others guilt and furnished him at least with something kind on which to lean a sad and startled mind till youth and natural vigour and the dread of self-betrayal and a thought that spread from time to time in gladness o'er his face that she he loved could have done nothing base helped to restore him to his usual life though grave at heart and with himself at strife and he would rise betimes day after day and mount his favourite horse and ride away miles in the country looking round about as he glowed by to force his thoughts without and when he found it vain would pierce the shade of some enwooded field or closer glade and there dismounting idly sit and sigh or pluck the grass beside him with vague eye and almost envy the poor beast that went cropping it here and there with dumb content but thus at least he exercised his blood and kept it livelier than inaction could and thus he earned for his thought-working head the power of sleeping when he went to bed and was enabled still to wear away that task of loaded hearts another day but she the gentler frame 
the shaken flower plucked up to wither in a foreign bower the struggling virtue loving fallen she the wife that was the mother that might be what could she do unable thus to keep her strength alive but sit and think and weep forever stooping o'er her broidery frame half blind and longing till the night time came when worn and wearied out with the day's sorrow she might be still and senseless till the morrow and oh the morrow how it used to rise how would she open her despairing eyes and from the sense of the long lingering day rushing upon her almost turn away loathing the light and groan to sleep again then sighing once for all to meet the pain she would get up in haste and try to pass the time in patience wretched as it was till patience self in her distempered sight would seem a charm to which she had no right and trembling at the lip and pale with fears she shook her head and burst into fresh tears old comforts now were not at her command the falcon reached in vain from off his stand the flowers were not refreshed the very light the sunshine seemed as if it shone at night the least noise smote her like a sudden wound and did she hear but the remotest sound of song or instrument about the place she hid with both her hands her streaming face but worse to her than all and oh thought she that ever ever such a worse could be the sight of infant was or child at play then would she turn and move her lips and pray that heaven would take her if it pleased away i passed the meetings paolo had with her calm were they in their outward character or pallid efforts rather to suppress the pangs within that either's might be less and ended mostly with a passionate start of tears and kindness when they came to part thinner he grew she thought and pale with care and i twas i that dashed his noble air he saw her wasting yet with placid show and scarce could help exclaiming in his woe o gentle creature look not at me so but prince giovanni whom her wan distress had touched of late with a new tenderness which to his fresh surprise did but appear to wound her more than when he was severe began with other helps perhaps to see strange things and missed his brother's company what a convulsion was the first sensation rage wonder misery scorn humiliation a self-love struck as with a personal blow gloomy revenge a prospect full of woe all rushed upon him like the sudden view of some new world foreign to all he knew where he had waked and found diseases visions true if any lingering hope that he was wrong smoothed o'er him now and then it was not so long next night as sullenly awake he lay considering what to do the approaching day he heard his wife say something in her sleep he shook and listened she began to weep and moaning loudlier seemed to shake her head till all at once articulate she said he loves his brother yet dear heaven twas i then lower voiced only do let me die the prince looked at her hastily no more he dresses takes his sword and through the door goes like a spirit in the morning air his squire awaked attends and they repair silent as wonder to his brother's room his squire calls him up too and forth they come the brothers meet giovanni scarce in breath yet firm and fierce paolo as pale as death may i request sir said the prince and frowned your ear a moment in the tilting ground there brother answered paolo with an air surprised and shocked yes brother cried he there the word smote crushingly and paler still he bowed and moved his lips as waiting on his will giovanni turned and from the tower descending the squires with looks of sad surprise attending they issued forth in the moist striking air and toward the tilt-yard crossed a planted square was a fresh autumn dawn vigorous and chill the lightsome morning star was sparkling still ere it turned into heaven and far away appeared the streaky fingers of the day an opening in the trees took paolo's eye as with his brother mutely he went by it was a glimpse of the tall wooded mound that screened francesca's favourite spot of ground massy and dark in the clear twilight stood as in a lingering sleep the solemn wood 
and through the bowering arch which led inside he almost fancied once that he descried a marble gleam where the pavilion lay starting he turned and looked another way arrived and the two squires withdrawn apart the prince spoke low as with a labouring heart and said before you answer what you can i wish to tell you as a gentleman that what you may confess and as he spoke his voice with breathless and pale passion broke will implicate no person known to you more than disquiet in its sleep may do paolo's heart bled he waved his hand and bent his head a little in acknowledgment say then sir if you can continued he one word will do you have not injured me tell me but so and i shall bear the pain of having asked a question i disdain but utter nothing if not that one word and meet me this he stopped and drew his sword paolo seemed firmer grown from his despair he drew a little back and with the air of one who would do well not from a right to be well thought of but in guilt's despite i am said he i know twas not so ever but fight for it and with a brother never how with uplifted voice exclaimed the other the vile pretence who asked you with a brother brother o oh, traitor to the noble name of malatesta i deny the claim what wounded deepest strike me to the core me and the hopes which i can have no more and then as never malatesta could shrink from the letting a few drops of blood it is not so cried paolo tis not so but i would save you from a further woe a further woe recreant retorted he i know of none yes one there still may be save me the woe save me the dire disgrace of seeing one of an illustrious race bearing about a heart which feared no law and a vile sword which yet he dare not draw brother dear brother paolo cried nay nay i'll use the word no more but peace i pray you trample on a soul sunk at your feet tis false exclaimed the prince tis a retreat to which you fly when manly wrongs pursue and fear the grave you bring a woman to a sudden start yet not of pride or pain paolo here gave he seemed to rise again and taking off his cap without a word he drew and kissed the crossed hilt of his sword looking to heaven then with a steady brow mild yet not feeble said i'm ready now a noble word exclaimed the prince and smote preparingly on earth his firming foot the squires rushed in between in their despair but both the princes told them to beware back gerard cried giovanni i require no teacher here but an observant squire back tristan paolo cried fear not for me all is not worst that so appears to thee and here said he a word the poor youth came starting in sweeter tears to hear his name a whisper and a charge there seemed to be given to him kindly yet inflexibly both squires then drew apart again and stood mournfully both each in his several mood the one half sullen at these dreadful freaks the other with the tears streaming down both his cheeks the prince attacked with all his might and main nor seemed the other slow to strike again yet as the fight grew warm twas evident one fought to wound the other to prevent giovanni pressed and pushed and shifted aim and played his weapon like a tongue of flame paolo retired and warded turned on heel and led him step by step round like a wheel sometimes indeed he feigned an angrier start but still relapsed and played his former part what cried giovanni who grew still more fierce fighting in sport playing your cart and tears not so my prince said paolo have a care how you think so or i shall wound you there he stamped and watching as he spoke the word drove with his breast full on his brother's sword twas done he staggered and in falling pressed giovanni's foot with his right hand and breast then on his elbow turned and raising the other he smiled and said no fault of yours my brother an accident a slip the finishing one to errors by that poor old man begun you'll not you'll not his heart leapt on before and choked his utterance but he smiled once more for as his hand grew lax he felt it pressed and so his dim eyes sliding into rest he turned him round and dropped with hiding head 
and in that loosening drop his spirit fled but noble passion touched giovanni's soul he seemed to feel the clouds of habit roll away from him at once with all their scorning and out he spoke in the clear air of morning by heaven by heaven and all the better part of us poor creatures with a human heart i trust we reap at last as well as plough but there meantime my brother liest thou and paolo thou wert the completest knight that ever rode with banner to the fight and thou wert the most beautiful to see that ever came in press of chivalry and of a sinful man thou wert the best that ever for his friend put spear in rest and thou wert the most meek and cordial that ever among ladies eat in hall and thou wert still for all that bosom gored the kindest man that ever struck with sword at this the words forsook his tongue and he who scarcely had shed tears since infancy felt his stern visage thrill and meekly bowed his head and for his brother wept aloud the squires with glimmering tears tristan indeed heart-struck and hardly able to proceed double their scarfs about the fatal wound and raise the body up to quit the ground giovanni starts and motioning to take the way they came follows his brother back and having seen him laid upon the bed no further look he gave him nor tears shed but went away such as he used to be with looks of stately will and calm austerity tristan who when he was to make the best of something sad and not to be redressed could show a heart as firm as it was kind now locked his tears up and seemed all resigned and to francesca's chamber took his way to tell her what his master bade him say he found her ladies up and down the stairs moving with noiseless caution and in tears and that the sad news had before him got though she herself it seemed yet knew it not the door as tenderly as miser's purse was opened to him by her aged nurse who shaking her old head and pressing close her withered lips to keep the tears that rose made signs she guessed what twas he came about and so his arm squeezed gently and went out the princess who had passed a fearful night toiling with dreams fright crowding upon fright had missed her husband at that early hour and when she tried to rise found she'd no power yet as her body seemed to go her mind felt though in anguish still strangely resigned and moving not nor weeping mute she lay wasting in patient gravity away the nurse some time before with gentle creep had drawn the curtains hoping she might sleep but suddenly she asked though not with fear brangin what bustles that i seem to hear and the poor creature who the news had heard pretending to be busy had just stirred something about the room and answered not a word who's there said that sweet voice kindly and clear which in its stronger days was joy to hear its weakness now almost deprived the squire of his new firmness but approaching nigher madam said he tis i one who may say he loves his friends more than himself to-day tristan she paused a little and then said tristan my friend what noise thus haunts my head something i'm sure has happened tell me what i can bear all though you may fancy not madam replied the squire you are i know all sweetness pardon me for saying so my master bade me say then resumed he that he spoke firmly when he told it me that i was also madam to your ear firmly to speak and you firmly to hear that he was forced this day whether or no to combat with the prince and that although his noble brother was no fratricide yet in that fight and on his sword he died i understand with firmness answered she more low in voice but still composedly now tristan faithful friend leave me and take this trifle here and keep it for my sake so saying from the curtains she put forth her thin white hand that wore a ring of worth and he with tears no longer to be kept from quenching his heart's thirst silently wept and kneeling took the ring and touched her hand to either streaming eye with homage bland and looking on it once gently up started and in his reverent stillness so departed 
her favourite lady then with the old nurse returned and fearing she must now be worse gently withdrew the curtains and looked in oh who that feels one godlike spark within shall say that earthly suffering cancels not frail sin there lay she praying upwardly intent like a fair statue on a monument with her two trembling hands together pressed palm against palm and pointing from her breast she ceased and turning slowly towards the wall they saw her tremble sharply feet and all then suddenly be still near and more near they bent with pale inquiry and close ear her eyes were shut no motion not a breath the gentle sufferer was at peace in death i pass the grief that struck to every face and the mute anguish all about that place in which the silent people here and there went soft as if she still could feel their care the gentle tempered for a while forgot their own distress or wept the common lot the warmer apter now to take offence yet hushed as they rebuked and wondered whence others at such a time could get their want of sense fain would i haste indeed to finish all and so at once i reached the funeral private twas fancied it must be though some thought that her sire the poor old duke would come and some were wondering in their pity whether the lovers might not have one grave together next day however from the palace gate a blast of trumpets blew like voice of fate and all in sable clad forth came again of knights and squires the former sprightly train gerard was next and then a rank of friars and then with heralds on each side two squires the one of whom upon a cushion bore the coroneted helm prince paolo wore his shield the other then there was a space and in the middle with a doubtful pace his horse succeeded plumed and trapped in black bearing the sword and banner on his back the noble creature as in state he trod appeared as if he missed his princely load and with back rolling eye and lingering pride to hope his master still might come to ride then tristan heedless of what passed around rode by himself with eyes upon the ground then heralds in a row and last of all appeared a hearse hung with an ermined pall and bearing on its top together set a prince's and princess's coronet mutely they issued forth black slow dejected nor stopped within the walls as most expected but passed the gates the bridge the last abode and towards ravenna held their silent road the prince it seems struck since his brother's death with what he hinted with his dying breath and told by others now of all they knew had instantly determined what to do and from a mingled feeling which he strove to hide no longer from his taught self-love of sorrow shame resentment and a sense of justice owing to that first offence had on the day preceding written word to the old duke of all that had occurred and though i shall not so concluded he otherwise touch thine age's misery yet as i would that both one grave should hide which can and must not be where i reside tis fit though all have something to deplore that he who joined them once should keep to part no more the wretched father who when he had read this letter felt it wither his grey head and ever since had paced his room about trembling and at the windows looking out had given such orders as he well could frame to meet devoutly whatsoever came and as the news immediately took flight few in ravenna went to sleep that night but talked the business over and reviewed all that they knew of her the fair and good and so with wondering sorrow the next day waited till they should see that sad array the days were then at close of autumn still a little rainy and towards nightfall chill there was a fitful moaning air abroad and ever and anon over the road the last few leaves came fluttering from the trees whose trunks now thronged to sight in dark varieties the people who from reverence kept at home listened till after noon to hear them come and hour on hour went by and naught was heard but some chance horseman or the wind that stirred till towards the vesper hour and then twas said some heard a voice which seemed as if it read and others said that they could hear a sound of many horses trampling the moist ground still nothing came till on a sudden just as the wind opened in a rising gust a voice of chanting rose and as it spread they plainly heard the anthem for the dead 
it was the choristers who went to meet the train and now were entering the first street then turned aside that city young and old and in their lifted hands the gushing sorrow rolled but of the older people few could bear to keep the window when the train drew near and all felt double tenderness to see the bier approaching slow and steadily on which those two in senseless coldness lay who but a few short months it seemed a day had left their walls lovely in form and mind in sunny manhood he she first of womankind they say that when duke guido saw them come he clasped his hands and looking round the room lost his old wits for ever from the morrow none saw him after but no more of sorrow on that same night those lovers silently were buried in one grave under a tree there side by side and hand in hand they lay in the green ground and on fine nights in may young hearts betrothed used to go there to pray end of canto four End of the story of Rimini by Lee Hunt